I'm Harvey Feinberg, and as uh, chair of the planning committee for this workshop, I have the great pleasure to welcome all of you here at the lecture room at the National Academy of Sciences, and also those of you who are listening on the web. We're delighted to have all of you with us for a one and a half day workshop on enhancing scientific reproducibility through transparent reporting. I'd like uh, first to acknowledge and to thank especially the sponsors of today's workshop, the National Institutes of Health, the Cell Press, the Lancet, and Nature Research. We're very grateful for their support for this event. We appreciate their ongoing leadership and initiative on the key topic of concern to us on transparency in science. This workshop at the National Academies is sponsored internally by four roundtables, uh, which include <clears throat> the Forum on Drug Discovery, Development, and Translation, the Forum on Neuroscience and Nervous System Disorders, the National Cancer Policy Forum, and the Roundtable on Genomics and Precision Health. Each of these groups at the academies offers a neutral venue where stakeholders from across government, academia, industry, foundations, consumer and patient groups, and other interested parties can come together to discuss and to resolve issues of mutual interest and concern. Through workshops and other activities sponsored by the forums, these activities bring together thought leaders to focus attention among the professions, leaders, and the public on these critical areas with the intent of fostering collaboration to help understand and to meet the needs that these complicated issues raise. Now, in accordance with the procedures of the National Academies, there was an independent planning committee that was uh, set up in order to uh, plan this workshop. And the members of the committee are indicated here uh, on the slide. I'd like to first personally express my deep appreciation to each of them for their participation and active role in planning this workshop. And also invite those of you here to help me to acknowledge and to thank them. <laughs> The workshop is uh, considered in the academies a standalone activity. That is, it's not a part of any ongoing consensus study by the National Academies. As we will hear and learn, this workshop does build on the previous work of a number of important reports produced by the academies, including a recent report on reproducibility and replicability in science that I'll be speaking more about in just a moment, but also an, a previous report on open science by design, realizing a vision for 21st century research, and a work, a very important report on fostering integrity in research. All of those have important lessons that bear on our discussions uh, during this day and a half. There will be a summary of the presentations and our discussions that are made during the workshop. These will be prepared by a rapporteur. Their intent is to reflect what transpired at the workshop, uh, as well as uh, related workshops in a series. Now, these will be prepared in accordance with the policies of the National Academies, and they will be made broadly available to the public. Uh, this means that all the views presented in the summary reflect those of individual workshop participants, the presenters or discussants, as the case may be. A workshop summary does not contain uh, formal recommendations or findings by the planning committee or by any other committee. It's rather intended to encapsulate and to disseminate the key ideas that we will be developing over the course of this day and a half. And if we fulfill the aspirations of the planning committee, there will be products of thinking and of future action that emerge from our mutual deliberations over this day and a half. Now, just a few uh, brief housekeeping measures for those of you here and want to plan time for those who are listening in on the web. We'll typically be taking a morning break uh, between 11 and 11.30. That is at some point between 11 and 11.30. 
Uh, please uh, do remember that the workshop is being webcast live. So if you are speaking, raising a question, for example, please do use one of the microphones here locally that are available uh, in each of the, of the aisles. Uh, the transcript of the uh, workshop will be available, but staff are going to be uh, using it uh, only uh, for their purposes in writing the workshop preceding uh, summary. For those of you who follow on Twitter, there is a Twitter hashtag for this workshop. It is hash reproducibility in science, all one word. Uh, and we should have a slide that will uh, summarize that, uh, that hashtag. Uh, nope, I guess not yet. Jumping a bit ahead on the slides, my apologies. Uh, we uh, will be able to have questions uh, from the audience. Again, uh, do use uh, the microphones. All of the slides that are being presented in the course of today's workshop will be posted approximately a week after our conclusion tomorrow on the website for the workshop. Uh, let me pause at this moment uh, to ask if there are any questions on the logistics or the way in which we're proposing to proceed in the course of these days. The only additional point that I would offer at this time is that uh, all of the bios of our speakers, uh, many eminent individuals who have given their time and are going to share their thoughts and ideas and experience with us are included in a handout, and so we will not be uh, introducing our speakers at length, uh, meaning no uh, less than full respect for each, but I hope you'll understand that we are uh, attempting to make best use of all of our time together and uh, the full bios are available for each of us to uh, review. At the outset of the workshop, we thought it would be uh, helpful if I took a few minutes to review the most recent of the three reports that I alluded to. This was a report on reproducibility and replicability in science. While our workshop uh, today is really uh, focused on transparency and uh, particularly uh, what we need to do to enhance transparency for scientific reproducibility focused especially on preclinical research of particular interest to our main sponsor, the NIH. The study that I'll be uh, covering now was sponsored by the National Science Foundation and actually grew out of a mandate uh, from uh, the U.S. Congress that uh, specified and requested the National Science Foundation to ask the academies to undertake a report uh, on the subject of reproducibility and replicability in science. Uh, the committee's charge was uh, several parts. First, it was asked to define the terms reproducibility and replicability accounting for a diversity of uses across many fields of science and engineering. I can tell you parenthetically this proved to be a more daunting task than it might seem from a simple expression of what's the definition. Secondly, uh, the committee was asked to examine the extent of the problems of non-reproducibility and non-replicability. Third, it was asked to review current activities to improve reproducibility and replicability. And finally, it was asked to determine if a lack of replicability and reproducibility has an impact on the overall health of science and engineering, and especially on the perception of the public of the reliability and utility of science. Now, I want to jump to the big conclusions, so in case you get distracted over the next few minutes, you'll get the essence of the findings. First, the main idea that the committee wanted to convey is that there's no crisis in science over these issues, but there's also no room for complacency about shortcomings in our ability to reproduce or to replicate previous findings. Uh, secondly, reproducibility is critically important, and I'll explain in just another moment how the committee defined the term 
reproducibility, and yet it's not easy enough to attain that ideal of reproducibility. And third, there are elements related to non-replicability that are of serious concern, but as I'll explain in a moment, replicability is a more nuanced topic and has many elements that are not necessarily concerns, but may even be prompters for progress in science. And a very important underlying theme in the report is that neither of these two ideas of reproducibility or replicability alone are the primary ways of assuring reliability of scientific knowledge. And to give you an illustration, a set of data may be perfectly reproducible in terms of leading to a particular computational result. But if the data are grounded on flawed evidence or obtained in a way that doesn't really relate to the question you think they are answering, it may be that a set of data, a study, is perfectly reproducible but not very useful. And at the other extreme, if you fail to replicate an experiment, that may be an indicator of some important previously unrecognized element that could be important in determining what the experiment actually produces. And this could be something as trivial as whether you've stirred or shaken a, uh, a, a mixture in order to get uh, a certain level of the experiment, or it could be very sophisticated insight into a complex experiment with many determinants and prove ways of learning more about nature and science rather than a detriment to science. And so it's very important, as critical as these concepts are, to keep them in context of how they contribute or not to the overall reliability of scientific knowledge. Now, there's a lot of confusion about the uses of these terms. Sometimes in different fields, one term is used to mean everything. Sometimes in different fields, the opposite meanings are taken to use these terms. And the way in which our committee defined and differentiated reproducibility and replicability uh, has a relation to the way we are discussing our topic today but I want to take a minute to explain that uh, clearly. The committee chose to make an important distinction between whether the effort is to reproduce results based on an existing data set. So is it computationally reproducible? And the committee chose to use that as the definition of reproducibility. And it made a distinction between that and replicability, which in the committee's definition is the effort to obtain consistent results across different studies that gain their own data aimed at the same scientific question. Now, in the way the NIH traditionally has used the term reproducibility, it actually encompasses aspects of both of these phenomena. And as we will be talking about it in the course of our workshop, defined as reproducibility in science, we're going to be talking about both of these aspects of computation and reproduction of a scientific experiment. The important point is this. The determinants of whether you can reproduce or replicate, namely whether you have had clear, specific, and complete descriptions with all of the relevant artifacts and elements, reagents or data or code available to make it possible to reproduce or replicate. That set of concerns actually spans the definitions both of computational reproducibility in the committee's terms and replicability. What is different between the two and why the committee felt it was so important to make this distinction is that when you begin to think about the consequences of failure to reproduce computationally or to replicate in an experiment or a study, those implications can be quite different. In general, if you start with the same data set and you have available the same code and all the artifacts, you expect perfect reproducibility. Whereas in an experimental setting, where you may have high complexity and relatively low controllability 
of the experimental elements, you may not expect that there's perfect replicability. And it was an argument of that type on the consequences that led the committee to make this important distinction and to propose these definitions as standard. But I want to make it clear that when we talk in these two days, we're going to be talking about elements of your ability to reproduce a previous experiment, whether starting with the data or starting with the question. And that is of relevance and interest to the NIH and to us according to our discussions in these days. I probably will be using reproducibility and replicability myself in uh, conformity with our committee's uh, recommendations, as we indeed hope over time they will uh, become uh, more standard and universal. Uh, but I want to make clear that both are relevant to our discussions in this workshop. Now, a motive for putting special attention on computational reproducibility is the ubiquity of data in science today, and especially the growing reliance on what are called big data. This slide depicts that special moment when the first black hole image was processed. This is Katie Bauman, the scientist involved. Uh, I think her face tells the story of scientific discovery, an exciting moment dependent on vast amounts of data dependent on an ability to use and reuse with many internal checks before the release of that image. Now, it turns out that when you examine the use of computation across the sciences broadly, very often studies are reported without the full array of data, code, digital artifacts, and other elements required for an independent investigator to reproduce the original computational results. In the studies, uh, reviews noted here, on average, it was fewer than half of the reviewed studies met that standard. Now, there are some signs of, Im of improved uh, recognition and attention to this. For example, here on the National Center for Environmental Information website, there are references and clickable connections to the underlying data sets and code, and that's a big step forward in transparency. And for example, badging, and we'll be perhaps talking about badging systems, uh, is a growing way of recognizing, acknowledging, certifying, and in a way expressing approval of a scientist or study that presents an open, transparent, reproducible set of uh, findings. Uh, there are many obstacles to reproducibility that the committee reviewed. Uh, starting with the difficulty of adequate record keeping, the fact that reporting is often lacking critical elements, the obsolescence of digital artifacts, which may not be forever available in the form and code as desired. The flawed attempts to reproduce others' results, that is, you may fail to replicate not because there was an error in the original, but because the replicator failed to follow exactly the instruction or the steps of the original. And cultural barriers in which there is still a residue of feeling that this doesn't really matter that much. Trust my data. And that's a sentiment that I think in the course of our workshop we're going to have to be uh, dealing with as well. Among the key challenges uh, to improving reproducibility in the computational sense that the committee described are the complexity and multiple steps involved and the need to systematically capture and report detailed provenance of data, code, computational equipment, and so on. Secondly, that full reproducibility may not be possible, especially in studies that rely on non-public or proprietary data sets. And nevertheless, the ability to reproduce through transparency does contribute to confidence in the original results. I mentioned that replicability is a more nuanced and complex subject in terms of the meaning of failure to replicate. 
Uh, and that is because replicability takes many different forms. And there are a certain subset of studies in science that are intrinsically not replicable because they study ephem ephemeral phenomena like an earthquake. Or they are looking at uh, long-term studies that have collected data over multiple years and to replicate it is just impractical because you'd have to start again and even then it would be a different cohort and it just cannot be exactly uh, replicated. And the committee also made an important observation, I think, in that most replications in science never go reported as such because they're a scientist, in effect, reaffirming a previous scientist's work in order to build on it and to move on to a new discovery. And so much of what uh, you may think of as the pool of studies aimed at replication really represents just the tip of a deeper set of replications that go on automatically in the course of the conduct of, of science. The committee recognized that there were occasions when it could be important specifically to undertake a particular replication of a particular study, even though the underlying premise is that it's the totality of scientific evidence that matter. But when could it make a real difference? whether a given study should be attempted to be replicated. For example, if the results of the original study are taken as important for policy choices or for clinical decisions or for personal decision making or for huge investment in science. In other words, if the consequences of that uh, conclusion from the original study are very high, it would be worth verifying through a replication that you can rely on the original. Secondly, if the original study creates uh, controversial results that seem very surprising, uh, that means the likelihood in advance that that would have been true might be judged by most investigators as small. That might be a basis for saying that study, before we have more confidence, should be replicated. Third, if there are recognized flaws in the methods or in the approach taken in the original, that could be a reason. And finally, in general, if the costs of the replication are offset by the potential benefits from a pure cost-benefit point of view, it could still be worthy to focus expressly on that replication. Uh, we, dis we differentiated uh, in our discussions between what we called the potentially helpful and the distinctly unhelpful sources of non-replicability. So in the first instance, could you identify new sources of variation from nature uh, as a potentially helpful reason? And as an example, if there's anything from error to fraud, that is a distinctly unhelpful source of non-replicability, and the aim uh, in science ought to be to eliminate uh, those sources while recognizing and valuing the helpful sources. We talked about what makes a study more or less amenable uh, to replicability, and without going into it too much, the committee talked about the two dimensions of complexity of the system under study and the degree of control that the experimenter can exert. In general, if it's low complexity and high controllability, you have a very high chance of replication. If it's a highly complex system with many parts, some of which may not be recognized as influential, and it's a system that the experimenter has lack of control over certain elements that are stochastic or otherwise probabilistic, for example, then uh, this is a study that could be uh, amenable to non-replication. Uh, we spend a great deal of time on the issues of statistical inference because these are so prominent in the concerns about replicability. And in part, it derives from a misunderstanding and misuse of the concepts of a p-value and statistical significance. When many people hear a figure like p less than 0.05, in their minds, they think, oh, that must mean that there's a 95% chance this study is correct. And, of course, the p-value has nothing to do, well, it has something, but not directly to do with the likelihood 
that a study is correct. The p-value is premised on the idea that there is no difference between a study group and a control group, and the p-value indicates the probability that you would nevertheless have found a difference as great as you observed when there was, in truth, no difference between the control and the study. So when you start with the premise of no difference, it can't possibly be an indicator of the likelihood of there being a difference. You've assumed at the outset no difference. There is an appendix to our report which goes into what is called a Bayesian approach to analyzing and estimating the likelihood of a finding being correct given observations and some other assumptions, but that is not the way p-values are typically used and sometimes, in fact, you might say too often misunderstood. There's an especially perverse effect of reliance on the statistical significance criterion, which are rigidly enforced as whether a finding or paper is publishable or not publishable. One of the perverse effects is a kind of fishing for the element of your study that can pass a statistical significance test, especially if you've employed that test erroneously without correcting for the multiple times you're looking for something that could be statistically uh, significant. That's called p-hacking. It's a little bit like drawing a bullseye around wherever your arrow happened to land and deciding you've hit the bullseye. So it's a very perverse practice, but it does happen. And uh, the important point here is that improvements in the way we utilize statistics and the way we report statistics could be an element to help remove the incentives for these kind of perverse misuses of uh, statistics. I had a wonderful professor uh, once who explained that it is easy to lie with statistics. It is even easier to lie without them. So uh, we want to use them, but we want to use them uh, properly. properly. I just want to say replicability is not a trivial matter to assess. There are many different contexts in which the question can be raised, and different methods would need to be applied. Uh, what I do want to acknowledge is that there are many efforts among the key constituencies that we'll be talking about in the course of this workshop already to uh, remediate unhelpful sources of non-replicability. And this includes the development of an array of guidelines, some of which we'll be talking about, uh, efforts by publishers, efforts by uh, reviews, and efforts by institutions, as well as researchers. And we'll be coming back to these in the course of our discussion uh, at this, uh, at this uh, workshop. Uh, I mentioned that there are multiple uh, efforts at replication so it's very difficult to answer the specific charge question, how extensive is non-replication, when most efforts at replication are not recognized as such. I want to just take a moment to review the data we covered on the public trust in science, because it's a pretty encouraging story. This looks at a variety of constituencies, major corporations, the press, the Congress, the military, and the scientific community over a period of time uh, dating all the way from 1978 to 2018. So it's over that long period of time. And this is what the uh, level of confidence is uh, for uh, the scientific community. This is what it is for major companies. This is what it is for the press. Anyone want to guess where the Congress comes? <laughs> Pretty much right. It's not too different from the press. But interestingly, the military has the highest level of public trust for a sustained period, particularly spiking uh, in 1991 for reasons we're all familiar with. Uh, key recommendations were offered in the report to many of the key constituencies, the funders, policymakers, researchers, the editors, conference organizers, and publishers, professional societies, and journalists. 
In our conference over these two days, we're going to be focusing especially on the opportunities for four key constituents, for researchers, for institutions, for funders, and for publishers and editors. Those four key constituents are going to be our focus in this day and a half. And we're going to try in the course of our work to discover the ways in which each of those constituents can provide added measures to reinforce, encourage, and even require levels of transparency in reporting for science. So that's going to be our purpose and, and message. I would just cover a few points that um, may be relevant to our workshop uh, that were part of the report of the Committee on Reproducibility and Replicability. Uh, basically, uh, the expectation of the committee should be sharing and transparency. That should be the expectation of the scientific uh, community. Uh, costs, lack of infrastructure, some elements of the current scientific culture, weak incentives, all serve as obstacles to achieving a persistent availability of the digital objects, of the reagents, I might add, in our context, of all the elements that are needed to reproduce or replicate a previous finding. Uh, it is uh, important to look at the available background of principles already developed to see what can be endorsed, what can be improved upon, how we can work from what has already been done. We are not in a position of having to start at all from a baseline of zero. There is a great deal that has already been accomplished, and we have the opportunity in this day and a half to build on that success to identify the key elements for future action and to encourage further progress toward transparency in science. Uh, one of our recommendations specifically spoke to the need for researchers to include those clear, specific, and complete descriptions, as I was mentioning before. We spoke to uh, the roles of various stakeholders, including the institutions that educate and that sponsor research, the societies that make up the professional bodies that codify standards for their membership and for the professions, the researchers who uh, must, in today's world, collaborate with experts in data science and statistics and the opportunities for those over time, and uh, the need for the funding agencies to pay attention to the importance and the needs in these areas. Uh, we recommended that journals and scientific societies should describe their policies relevant to achieving reproducibility and replicability and basically <laughs> stick to those policies. And that includes presentations at conferences as well as publications. We spoke about the nature of reviews as well as the idea of establishing a review criterion that research reports include a thoughtful discussion of the uncertainty entailed in the generation and interpretation of the study. This is uh, critical in the areas of replicability because they set the groundwork for the investigator's understanding of those elements that could in fact lead to uncertainty and non-replicability. We spoke to the importance of funders thinking how in their grant applications and reviews they would be able to evaluate these uncertainties and to look for the conformity to guidelines for transparency as part of the review criteria as a relatively low-cost way to signal the field of science of the importance in transparency, the relevance to their likelihood of success as grant applic applicants, and the significance of all of this effort to the progress in science. Uh, I want to conclude by expressing our thanks uh, on behalf of that uh, report committee to the National Science Foundation and to the Sloan Foundation for their support of this study. We hope that it 
serves as a useful backdrop to our deliberations in the course of the next uh, day and a half. And uh, we have uh, a great opportunity to take advantage of all that's been done, build on it, and make substantial progress working together. Thank you all very much. Now, I'd like to invite any question or comment from uh, members of the audience here, either specifically on this previous study or on its bearing to our work in the next uh, couple of days. Please. Uh, we're going to please go to the mic if you have a question, one or the other, and we'll alternate between the middle aisle and the, and the side. Please. Tom Kern, Children's Mercy, Kansas City. Uh, I first want to thank you on the report. It really is a marvel. It's extremely balanced, well put together, and as we discussed yesterday, very well written. It's actually a, a fun read. Um, I would like to just throw one other observation into the mix uh, in the area of um, errors and replicability not always being bad. So I had experience in a, in a field uh, where 90% um, of the work on a new cancer target was wrong. It was wrong because of methodology, inappropriate choice of models, and it, uh, these studies appeared in all the journals represented here, very high profile kind of work. And then there were industry studies that actually pointed out 90% of this stuff doesn't hold up. However, they held on to the 10%. So the 10% were pretty rare cancers that probably wouldn't have justified the development of a new uh, chemical entity targeting this new target. Uh, companies got involved because of the hype. They thought 25% of human cancer can be treated with this new entity. When they discovered that it was really a very small number, several of those companies kept going and new products were actually approved and patients benefited. So at the time, it was extremely frustrating for me. I couldn't get papers published, couldn't get grants funded because I was the lone voice combating the field. Stepping away for a while, looking back objectively, I have to say thank you to all of those folks because otherwise this product wouldn't have been developed. That's a fabulous example. One can be right for the wrong reasons as well as wrong for the right reasons, it turns out. But thank you for that uh, uh, really interesting example. Please. So, Kay Lund, a long experience in basic science and now at NIH for four years. Um, I'm really concerned about basic science and mouse experiments and the prestigious journals like Science, Nature, because what happens is I've had many, many experiences where postdoc students, faculty have put in a report, they've been asked to do something else, and then they go back with an N of three. And the journals are accepting these. And so we've talked about this repeatedly and said, okay, if they're going to do this, could we say this is preliminary data? Um, and that's really not gone over with the journals. So I think it's really how do we get the journal culture to change? And if people are asked to do this, to be sure they say this is not a, a sufficiently powered study. Very uh, important point. I hope that we can uh, come to that, especially in our discussion about steps the different constituencies can take, including the journals and the researchers. And indeed, the funders could have a part in that as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, um, Deborah Sweet from Cell Press. I actually, I mean, related to that question, it just came up. I mean, we do let people say that, so I'm surprised. <laughs> um, I have a question about your definitions of replication and reproduction. So, I mean, I realize that this, the report that you wrote was largely, you know, didn't have a strong focus on life science, but for life science experiments, as often the case, someone will try to use their reagents to do the same experiment as someone else did. So it's kind of halfway in between the two that you're looking at. So I'm wondering where that would fit in your definitions. According to the committee's definition, if that second experimenter, however close to the first, is gathering new data, by uh, their experiment. In our terms, that's an example of replication. Mm -hmm. uh, a replication, as you're intuiting, though, can be relatively close, as near to identical as you can make it, or it could have some variation. There, are, And sometimes those are purposeful variation, so it's, in a way, a partial replication as well as a new effort. But on, on the, to answer your question specifically, by our definitions, that would be an effort at replication. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, I want to second the words of the first uh, questioner on what a terrific document that is. I can tell you that um, I really like the fact that it took across the fields of science. And, uh, and we are trying to use that now in our ethics course uh, as a, for teaching. I, w I want to also add my personal anecdote on a replication or so. So about eight or nine years ago, we published a paper in a high-end journal uh, describing an effect that was very important in our field. And, you know, we're very happy with the paper, and then I go to meetings and I hear that, uh, you know, we're having trouble replicating that. And uh, I obviously get very upset because you know that in science all you have is your reputation. And uh, so um, we go back into the lab and we find that some people can replicate it and some people can't replicate it. So even within a lab there is a replication problem uh, on it. And to make a long story short, it turned out that it had to do with the, with the way that people were putting it in a, in a, in a Eppendorf tube uh, and the amount of time that it was exposed to oxygen. So if you did it anaerobically, you could reproduce the experiment. It turned out to be that the phospholipids were easily oxidized by air. <laughs> and that was the entire difference. Uh, but it took years to solve, to solve that out. And uh, the good thing was that it led to a lot of other work. Uh, and then three groups published independently additional methods to that that is now a robust system. It's a wonderful example of where uh, the failure to replicate, in fact, gives new insight into a scientific principle or the way science works. Uh, I have a colleague who was uh, relaying to me his experience in which a failure to replicate depended on the exact brand of ceramic filter that was utilized in the lab. So the things that you might not think about uh, from the outset that could be consequential get revealed when you pay attention and follow up on these uh, failures, if you will, to uh, replicate. Fascinating anecdote. Thank you. Please. My name is John Gardner. I call myself these days a research ethicist, and I find that that second word causes me more trouble than uh, uh, is necessary, so I try to avoid it. Uh, I, as an example, about a year ago in this very same room, there was a discussion on one of the many uh, uh, topics in this area that uh, depend very heavily on statistical analysis and uh, high reliance in the talks on p-values. Uh, and I questioned, uh, I, I said that I was an ethicist and then I questioned uh, the use of the p-value and the answer from the speaker which seemed to be broadly accepted in the room but that's a standard in science. Because it's a standard, it must be ethical, it must be fine. Uh, obviously that's wrong and other people inside discussions out in the uh, ante room uh, recognize that. But another consequence was the next time I got up to uh, uh, make a comment, the uh, uh, person leading the discussion very carefully maneuvered the whole question and answer period so that they ran out of time just as I got to the microphone. So I no longer talk about it as an ethical matter, and I thank you for dealing with the crux of the p-value problem. Well, thank you for the comment. Uh, and I'm glad we had time to hear your comment today. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I would just like to add uh, on behalf of the planning committee that we would be remiss if we did not express our deep appreciation that all of us must feel to the staff who helped organize and develop the plans for this. Uh, Amanda, I wonder if you wouldn't mind standing and your colleagues who here, are here who served on the staff to uh, for give us a chance to recognize and thank you for your efforts. <laughs> <laughs>